Hello everyone, George here, and we're in chapter four of the Ray Tracer Challenge. Specifically, this chapter is taking everything we've done so far and just throwing it at a wall and saying, let's see what sticks. Uh, literally, I'm going to be touching just about everything inside of this particular video. First, I'm gonna start with the Mat 4 and Mat 3 objects. What I'm doing are creating static methods that are gonna allow me to translate, rotate, and scale different, um, well, basically uh, any of the vectors or points or multiply these matrices by each other so that we can move from coordinate space to coordinate space. Uh, here we can see I'm doing it mainly to the mat 4 objects, but I do incorporate these uh, abilities into the mat 2s and 3s in case in the future I happen to work with them. But for the most part, it's all about the mat 4 manipulating vectors and points in the future. Here I'm creating four different methods, a general rotate one, which will use rotate X, Y, and Z, uh, multiplying each matrix by each, each other matrix to do a full rotation all in one go. Now, I believe there might be a problem with that because I don't specify the exact order uh, and sometimes order of rotations matters. I know in Maya that's an issue, but uh, I have, I'm not sure yet, so we're going to get to that in the future. Here, of course, I need to convert everything over from a double to a float to work because the system.math class inside of C Sharp works with doubles and not floating point numbers instead. These are all from uh, equations that the book provides you, at least the rotates are. The translates and the scales are just easy. The translates are that uh, final column, the extra dimension in your 4x4 four four matrix, or that is going from 3 to 4, and then the uh, scales are just the diagonal elements. So it's just the rotate ones that are a little bit more different, and uh, you can derive all that stuff pretty easily mathematically just with a few equations. But uh, here we're going in, and I'm going to take those same things and bring them over into the mat 2s and the mat 3s. The idea, though, is that a mat 2 can only rotate around one axis, that is the z-axis coming out of it, so that's the only one I mess with. Then, of course, I've never implemented a shear matrix before, so this was kind of interesting. Uh, I never really needed to use one ever before, so uh, understanding how it takes different components and the relationships between the X, Y, X, Z, and so forth uh, means you need to spell out every single term and then specify which ones are ones and then which ones are going to be taking in the, the uh, how much of the X should influence the Y, the X, the Z, the Y, the X, and so forth in each of those different values. Now, once we've done that, it's time for us to create our transform tests, our, uh, our testing functions. So I'm going to uh, do a quick test to make sure that, uh, well, there's an issue here. I need to make sure that I'm dealing with degrees or radians. The book says to use radians, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. But in order to make a conversion from degrees to radians, I need to uh, put in pi. I try to remember it off the top of my head, 3.14159265358979. I think that's as far as I can get. But anyway, I'm just double checking to make sure everything's working. And uh, here we're going to be making those different matrices right now. Now, at the moment, I have them called Translate, Scale, and Rotate. I'm going to be renaming these shortly to Translate Matrix, Scale Matrix, Rotate X Matrix, because the book recommends you use fluent chain commands to do everything. Uh, and I'm going to require changing the naming convention I have shortly, once we get past this test, that is. Here I'm using pi divided by 2. Uh, it would be 2 pi divided by 4 if you wanted to, but we just might as well get rid of the, the factor of 2. Now we're going in here and I'm uh, checking each matrix, and shortly I'm going to do a test. We just look in to make sure the matrices are being manipulated in the proper places. Everything looks good from what I can tell. Now it's time to do the same thing for the shear matrix, which is interesting. All I'm going to do is see how the X is going to impact. I believe it's the Y term in this one, and uh, it should push everything over. Then we're going to define some points, but then I remember, wow, I haven't done any kind of mathematical uh, 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 anything between points and vectors and matrices. So now I need to go back to my vector in my matrix class and overload the uh, multiplication operator. And I'm going to do that for one of them. And uh, the only difference between a vector and a point, and the book makes this very clear, is that a point, when you end up multiplying a point by a translate matrix or a matrix that has translational capability, the, uh, the one at the end is what allows that to happen. A vector cannot be translated. Therefore, the zero at the end of a, of a vector will cancel out all of those translate terms and make it so that the vector remains unchanged whenever you use a translate matrix. Okay, so everything's looking good. I've got the multiplication down. And now we just need to bring in a vector and a point to make sure that those are going to work. And like I said, I need to make sure that a vector cannot be translated while a point can be. However, a vector can be scaled or rotated. So that is... That is um, a common element between those two. Now I'm going ahead and bringing those different values into each one, zooming on in and testing out the results of what happens after I manipulate each, each of these matrices. I notice an issue here and I believe I uh, failed to, yeah, right there. I had X, Y, Z, W, I need to replace that with the correct terms. Now I can go back in there and take a look at each one. I see the matrix and how it's going to uh, manipulate that particular vector or point in each of those subsequent steps. 
Now is where I decide, okay, I wanna do a fluent API. I wanna make it so I can chain these different commands together. So I move all the static methods that just generate a matrix and return it to you to translate or uh, transform and then matrix on the end. But I create a translate, rotate, and scale one that allow you to create a matrix. Well, not, you don't create a matrix actually here. Um, you create a, a temporary matrix you multiply the two matrices by each other, and then you replace your own internal mat object, that is the internal array you have, with the result of that, and then you return yourself. This allows me to do dot scale, dot rotate, dot translate, dot scale, dot, I could do them as long as I want to, chain all these together so that I can have one impact the next, impact the next, and I don't have to create each matrix individually and then, ha and then multiply them together one after the other. So it's very powerful and it will speed things up later on, I, I think. The, the book makes it sound like it's a good idea to do that. I never knew this was called fluency. I always thought this was just called chaining stuff. Uh, I did it a lot in Python and that's where I kind of learned it. And it's just something I kind of picked up and never realized it's an actual thing people are taught, which is kind of cool. Now I'm checking out the different matrices. Everything looks fine on those. Now it's time for the transform challenge. And I don't have the book at this point. I'm doing it off the top of my head. I'm at work and it's at the end of the day. I've done more than I need to. So why not take a second and, and do this? So I, I decide that I, for the transform test, I need to make a function called draw circle that allows you to draw more than a single point at a time. To do draw circle, you're gonna pass in the, the center X, center Y, and the radius as integer values. And then I'm going to make a block out of that, a start end, start end for X and Y. And that block is going to be used through a for loop, a double for loop, um, one for the X's and one for the Y's. And then I'm gonna go through each element in that block and test to see whether or not it is less than or equal to the radius that has been passed in. And if it is, then I'm gonna colorize that with whatever color I pass in, which I have not yet added as a parameter. You'll see that shortly. I'm also making sure I'm doing the uh, square check instead of uh, using the square root on this one. That's just a little bit faster because typically square roots are kind of slow to, in, uh, in terms of how they're implemented. That all works out. Now it's time for us to create our canvas. 100 by 100 pixels is fine. We define our radius of what the circle is going to be. So every time we create one of these circle objects, uh, the challenge, by the way, is to, cre is to create a clock, is to create 12 circles all rotated around uh, a central axis. Here I'm going in paint and I'm just telling myself how this is going to work. I've kind of already got it set in my head. I just want to make sure the math makes sense. I actually do mess it up a little bit at first, but it takes me five minutes to figure it out. Uh, so here we have the current location. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to translate the first point over. Now, right now I'm translating it over and up to a third of the way over. Um, then I'm going to take that. So you can think about the origin zero, zero, and now this has been translated over. Now, if I rotate about the Z axis on these, I can then uh, by a, a sixth of pi or a 12th of two pi, I can uh, mimic what's going to happen with a clock. And as this thing, it already has a translation offset. Therefore, as I rotate it, it will keep that translational offset. And it's almost like I have a radius and I'm going around this particular object. And then all I'm going to do after that is then translate it uh, by half the width and half the height of the image so that I get the whole thing centered in the image space, not in the zero, zero coordinate or the bottom, uh, or I should say top left-hand corner of the uh, image instead. I'm just making a couple changes. One is, uh, well, I'm going through now and I'm just doing a sanity check because things weren't working out right. And the reason this isn't working out right is because I'm chaining these together and I don't want to chain the translational offset over and over and over again. And that's what's happening here. So I create a temporary uh, variable that's going to then rotate whatever the original offset was. And I use that every time I draw the dot. Before I kept compounding um, the wrong transformations. Here I have things a little off, that's why I'm going to go in there and change it to 0, 0 on the height. Now I get something that looks more like a clock. All I have to do now is change the iterations to 12 and I will get my perfect little circle guy right there. Circles look a little funny. I'm not sure if that's just because I don't have a lot of pixels or if my algorithm's a little off. I'm guessing my algorithm could use a little bit more revision. Parts of it look right, but then again, it's not many pixels. So anyway, that was pretty much it for this uh, chapter. It was a chapter that looked easy on paper, but when I got down there, I realized how much you had to go back and recode all the different elements, uh, everything from your vectors to your points to your matrix classes to make everything work. Anyway, the next chapter is chapter five, and we're going to start actually drawing stuff. And I know we've been drawing stuff, but this is the big chapter where it kind of tells you, hey, we're finally going to start this real ray tracing uh, stuff that we're doing. And uh, I can't wait. So I'll see you then. 
And remember, if you happen to be following along yourself and you're doing the same challenge, please post below and let me know how you're doing. Or if you're stuck anywhere or want some advice, I can, I'll do my best. I'm not a pro, but I'll, I'll try. Thanks, everyone. See you next time. So long and goodbye.